Psalm 19. I like many times what the editors of the Bible that have compiled it into as they uh, compile it into different sections and John. themes for that section. Yeah, I got it. Themes for that section. And mine says, the perfect revelation of the Lord. What a great psalm this is. It's one of my favorites. I've preached on this psalm a number of times. But tonight, I want to look at it as we continue our study. And, oh, I hope they don't ask me that. As we look at the difficult scriptures and the difficult questions that are asked about the Bible. Tonight, the question is this. Are science and the Bible in opposition of each other? Now you hear of this a lot in the media today because we have we live in a culture where we have tried to remove God from everything. I believe what has been so important, and I'm not going to get into your political stance tonight, but I believe what is so important about this Supreme Court issue we've been dealing with with Judge Kavanaugh has really been a fight uh, on a spiritual <coughs> level. I believe it was that because Christians have been praying for a conservative Supreme Court. And with his nomination, it would give heavy weight, and with his confirmation on the Supreme Court, would give a much heavier conservative weight to the Supreme Court. I've actually even heard it best as this. The ultimate argument, the ultimate battle, was actually over life. One of the big issues that come up comes up to the Supreme Court each and every year is the issue of abortion. It's always somewhere in some fashion on the docket. Now, of course, Judge Kavanaugh sees Roe versus Wade as settled law. And that is true, Roe versus Wade is settled law. But what we have seen in recent years is if we can go this far, why not go just a little further and then a little further? It's kind of like a child. They will see just how far they can get away with something before they're scolded. And then if they're not scolded, they will go one step further. And then another step, and then another step. What we see now happening is with a, conserv a strong conservative voice, is that I believe now we are, as a Supreme Court, in a pro-life stance. So issues like partial birth abortion that have come up in recent years. Late term abortion, which is another thing that has come up in recent years. Those are things that as conservatives we are against. And Judge Kavanaugh is against those as well. So I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that what we have just seen was a spiritual battle at a government level. I believe we can look in the scripture, even back into the book of Daniel, and see a, a similar fight. Because there's always been a fight for protecting life. So I am praising God today for what has been accomplished. Because I believe our prayers, whether it was Judge Kavanaugh Irrelevant of him, of him, God has put another conservative voice on the high court and praise him for that. It, and I say that to say this. We have seen, even at the Supreme Court level, a tendency to draw a line between science and scripture. We, our children, are growing up thinking that you cannot be a scientist and a Christian at the same time. Matter of fact, one of the first questions that came up meeting with our youth about three years ago 
was given was made by Jeremy Diddy. Jeremy loves science. And Jeremy was really struggling with being a Christian and loving science. And one of his questions was, Pastor Sean, can the Bible and science work together? They were meant to work together. Never ever was the Bible meant to be in opposition with science, nor, the, nor science with the Bible. The Bible is not a history book, but it is a book of history. The Bible is not a science book, but it is a book of science. We look at our foundational scientists that have, that have seen the, the greatest philosophies of science, if you will. From gravity to light to relativity, they have been rooted in the Christian faith. And what you see in the scripture is the basis for every single scientific philosophy that we know exists. We talked about it the other night. Go the other morning, we were talking about the new heaven and new earth. Literally looking at earth at a subatomic level. When the Bible says that all things are held together by the word of his power, it is literally speaking at a subatomic level. At the basic level that things have their being, God makes it so by the word of his power. When we look at Psalm 19, and Psalm 19 starts with this, a verse that many of us are familiar with. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. One of the things that is amazing about this is the psalmist, as he wrote this, which we believe was David. We can imagine David as a shepherd sitting on a hill tending sheep, looking at the vastness of space. But what David did not have was a telescope. David did not realize in writing this that truly what he says is correct to the most microscopic and most telescopic conclusion. If we go out far into space, what we see is a universe that is of great order. We see galaxies that are a formations of a helix. It wasn't until the early 1900s and into the mid-1900s that the discovery of DNA became known and we saw our first glimpse of DNA only to realize that it is a double helix. That if we look to the universe, the most telescopic, and we look into the universe at the most microscopic, they look identical. As a matter of fact, the very protons and electrons, the electrons that come around the nucleus of an atom, is exactly what we see with a center sun in a galaxy and all of its corresponding planets and moons. So when David said, the heavens declare the glory of God, and it says the firmament shows his handiwork, he's literally talking about you cannot look at creation at any level that you do not see a defined pattern hand of a creator. His name, and he is God. If we look into verse 2, David says, day unto day utter speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where the voice is not heard. What does he mean? Everyone on earth sees the effect of night, and they see the effect of day. There is not a single language, there is not a single individual on planet earth that does not know the reality that there is a day and that there is a night. And David says those day, at day and that night have a voice. Do you know that is so true? There is the voice of the daytime. I call it the hustle and bustle. 
You hear the cars, the people talking. Life is happening. But there's the voice of nighttime. The crickets start singing. The locusts, the cicadas are ringing in your ears. The owls of the night are calling. They're sounds of the day and they're sounds of the night. And what, the, what David is saying is there's no separation from that reality. Everyone knows this. In verse 4 it says, Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. In them he has set a house or a tabernacle for the sun. There was no way possible that David understood at that time that the center of our galaxy, there was the sun. It would be hundreds of years later before that would be understood. Yet he is saying that in looking at this, God has created boundaries and God has created lines. As a matter of fact, in speaking of his life, David would say, Lord, the lines have fallen in pleasant places for me, the markers of my life. And he says here, the markers have gone out through all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. And in them, God has set a house for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. He's speaking of the sun, the brightness of it. I will never forget whenever Rebecca had her episode and, and she stopped breathing. And what God showed her at that time was amazing. And to hear her talk, as a, as a, as a two-year-old, two-and-a-half-year-old child. And she says, Dad, I saw an angel. And I said, Honey, what did the angel, was the angel little or big? And she said, He was huge. And his face was like the sun. Wow! Does that fire you up or what? Here, you think about the angels, I believe there, and she was showing us what God, that even the angels in heaven have the face of the sun, but they are no match for this bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Every 30 minutes, if you're on the International Space Station, you see a sunrise and a sunset, a sunrise and a sunset. I love going to the ISS website, and I will watch. I'll keep it blown up on my computer as I'm studying, and I will watch the sunrise and the sunset, and the sunrise and the sunset as the International Space Station at 23,600 miles per hour is making its way around the Earth. That's pretty cool. And you watch that, and you watch the sun, and here the, and here the psalmist says, it, it, it is like a, he's running his course. It's, it, the strong man, speaking of the sun, is running his race. It, it's rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end. He's talking about the sun here. It rises in the east and it sets in the west. And he's observed this. He says it's a circuit. It continues. Then he goes on to say, then, then he goes on to say, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. You feel its heat. Nothing is hidden from it. Even some of the most far off places in our own galaxy still benefit from the heat of the earth. Although they may be very cold. I, I cannot wait to see what the new solar observation satellite is going to bring back. We have a satellite. They don't realize that. We've got a probe that is going to the sun. Is going to be within 1600 miles of the sun. That's amazing. And it's going to extract plasma and energy from the, from the space and collect it and process it and send us back data. None of this was even possible in David's mind. Yet he says, no part of the world is hidden from it. He says, the law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Yeah, more than fine gold. Sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, abide them your servant is warned, and in keeping there is great reward. 
But who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let me not let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words, look at this, of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Here he goes from the word, the world, to the word. And he says, Lord, as I look at the vastness of your word, I understand that there are no limitations to your word. And Lord, let your word radically change my world. That's what he's saying. When I look at your handiwork, God, I cannot help but be amazed. Friday night, I went over to the village to see my mom. And she's got her little friends around there. And there's a bright, bright, uh, I'll say object in the sky. Because it wasn't a star. And one of the ladies says, you know what? I look every night. I've been watching that light. I wonder what it is. I said, let's find out. So I introduced her to the Sky Maps app on her phone. And she downloaded and now she's addicted. Isaac, she's addicted. She looked, puts it in her palm, and went, it's Jupiter. I said, yeah. And now look further to your left. She said, it's Pluto. And this is what I said. How glorious. You've been looking at that little light, but that little light is a massive planet with moons. There's an atmosphere on Jupiter that is unlike any other. There are winds on Jupiter that we can't even fathom on Earth. And the very size of that planet keeps our planet in its orbit. Do you realize the gravity from that planet affects you on ours? Wow. David said, God, the heavens declare your glory and the firmament Yet the question is, is science and the Bible in opposition to one another? Absolutely not. We look in Job, and Job says that when he imparted weight to the wind and metered out the waters by measure, when he set a limit for the rain and a course for the thunderbolt, then he saw it and declared it. He established it and searched it out. Isn't that something? Job 5.10 says, God gives rain on earth and sends water on the field. He wraps up the waters in his clouds, and the cloud does not burst under them. He obscures the face of the full moon and spreads his cloud over it. There, Job is speaking of the eclipse. At this also my heart trembles and leaps from its place, lifts it closely to the thunder of his voice and the rumbling that goes out from his mouth. Under the whole heaven he lets it loose and is lightning to the ends of the earth. How many of you have ever heard that thunder, that thunder that just seems to roll on and on and on? Y'all get there? He causes the vapors, the psalmist said, to ascend from the ends of the earth, who makes lightnings for the rain, who brings forth the wind from its treasure. Did you know that when the psalmist wrote that, he's talking about wind from its treasuries. What he didn't understand is that the patterns of the wind on earth have very distinct movements to them, as if they are coming from a, 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 an enclosure. I, I, let me give you a great example. Look at the continent of Africa. How many of you know we're in hurricane season? We got one kind of sitting out there right now, don't we? Michael is his name. But have you ever noticed that those storms as they come off of the coast of Africa, have you ever seen them, Brother Ken? They seem to roll in a very set way. 
That's what the psalmist is talking about. Has the sight of the psalmist ever seen the continent of Africa? Had the, did he know about the, the way these winds seem to come out of a, a storehouse? Yet we see from a scientific standpoint that they do. These winds move in many times very predictable ways. The Bible says the Lord by wisdom founded the earth. By understanding he established the heavens. By his knowledge the deeps were broken up. And the skies dripped with dew. Do you, can you imagine that the writer here, the, that Solomon had gone to the very bottom of the deepest ocean? Surely he did not. But what God revealed to him is that even at the bottom of the oceans, it is the, bro the deep were broken up. Do you know what we begin to see there? What is called plate tectonics. What we believe happened was that there, there was a the, the the continent was one large mass, and the great flood began the process of breaking all of that loose. We're actually seeing, I do believe, we're seeing that happen on the island of Indonesia right now. Because if you've been watching what has been going on, there have been significant earthquakes. There has been a tsunami, and followed up with that was within a matter of days was a very uh, was a, a volcano. We're seeing the plate. Shift. Remember the tsunami in 2004? It literally, it altered, I think it was the, the, the axis of the earth was altered by 0.013% because of that earthquake. There's no way that Solomon can understand that at the deepest parts of the earth, that the earth breaks open. Yet he writes as it is fact because he says God has done these things. Behold, Job said, God is exalted, and we do not know him. The number of his years is unsearchable. For he draws up the drops of water. They distill rain from the mist, which the clouds pour down. They drip upon man abundantly. What do you think he's describing there? The process of rain. It is the process of evaporation and condensation. It wasn't called that, but here are the principles right there in the scripture. Leviticus says that God says that I shall give you rains in their season so that the land will yield its produce and the trees of the field will bear its fruit. Our planet is dependent upon water. They do not say in their heart, let us fear the Lord God our way who gives rain in its season, but the autumn rain and the spring rain who keeps for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. See, back in that time, the spring rains and the autumn rains were indicative of the harvest season. The moon was very important. You know, we look at the farmer's almanac, Brother Max. I know his daddy and granddaddy and my daddy and granddaddy, you didn't live without the farmer's almanac. Matter of fact, bro, I think that was the first thing that they got when it came out was the farmer's almanac. We didn't start planting peas until the farmer's almanac says you can go ahead and plant the peas. My daddy, would, my daddy would sit around the kitchen table and he would talk about the farmers on that and he would talk about the weather cycles that had been predicted. And my goodness, right on the money. By the way, the farmers on that this year says, hold your horses because it's going to be one of the worst winters the northern hemisphere has seen. The seasons come and they are go and God orchestrates it that way. The Genesis 8.22 says, While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night, shall not cease. These are patterns that God has orchestrated. Genesis 9 says, It shall come about when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow will be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant. He's talking about the rainbow. We saw one of the coolest rainbows ever last week. We were coming through town, and it was late in the afternoon, and we were over by, you know where Economy Motors and Big Daddy's Barbecue, all that is? Well, Big Woods now, Big Woods Barbecue and all that. And we were looking over, and there was a, there was a storm cloud that, you know, they come across there. Some of the most amazing thunderheads I've ever seen there. But Brother Gerald, there was a rainbow, but this rainbow, it didn't, it didn't loop over like this. It, didn't, it wasn't like a bow. It was a band. And it stretched from one side of the sky across like a band. And Susan and I, we took a picture of it, and we just couldn't help but stare at it. It was the most amazing thing I had ever seen. I have always seen a rainbow. But I said, have you ever seen a rain band? And I just began, we just in our minds, Susan and I just looked at each other and said, God is so 
Amazing. That he uses his creation to just show us so much. Jonah says the world, the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea. And there was a great storm on the sea. So the ship was about to break up. Psalm 78 says he causes the east wind to blow in the heavens. And by his power he directed the south wind. All things are held together by the word of his power. And we could go on and on and on. Thus I was by day the heat consumed me and the frost by night and my sleep fled from my eyes. There is no separation between the scripture and science. They supplement each other in a powerful way. I want us to look at that as we look at this tonight. First, it's important to distinguish because the question becomes, is, are, is science in opposition with religion or is science in opposition with Christianity? Now that's where we've got to, that's where, that's where when people ask us the question, we've got to ask them a further question of verification. Because all religions are not in harmony with science. They are not. When you look at the Eastern religions, they're mystical. They're very, we're spiritual people on a spiritual plane, on a spiritual planet that may not even exist if we don't think about it. I mean, it, it's actually that ludicrous. It, it really, it, it is, it's this idea that uh, we, we, cannot, we cannot conclude and say that all religions are created equal because we know they're not. They're not. Can I tell you that tonight? All religions are not equal. But what, but, but, and we see that science is in opposition much with the teachings of Islam. It is in opposition with much of the teachings of Buddhism and Confucianism. But it is not in opposition with Christianity. Because why? Because Christianity views the world as a natural product of a transcendent creator who designated, designed, and brought it all into reality. Hallelujah. See, Christianity believes that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth because the Bible said it. The Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth. I do not believe we all came from monkey. I do not believe that there was some rogue, single cell, paramecium-like critter that went swimming in a toxic pool of evolutionary sludge that then crawled onto the other side looking like a lizard whose tail then dropped off and he started growing fur and climbed a tree. And then he climbs out of the tree because he grows a, 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 a thumb and his brain becomes a little larger and he climbs down from the tree and builds fire and now we have the microprocessor. Evolution is absolutely a lie from the pit of hell that does nothing but bring down God as creator and it, it flies in the face of what life is meant to be. It tells us that we are nothing more than single cell organisms that came through some miraculous super energized slime pool. The Bible says that we are created in the image and likeness of God. But in the 20th century when we begin to look at the climax of scientific research when we begin to see the DNA, when we begin to see molecular structure, we begin to see the nature and the structure of the atom, we begin to explore the depths of the universe, it is then that we realize that the assumptions that science had made, the Bible had already gave, given indication of. And that science does not do anything, but it, it absolutely shows that my Christian worldview is exactly on point. I don't need science to prove the Bible to me. But this is the deal. Everything science has offered, the scripture matches it every single time. The laws of logic, 
the orderly nature of the external world, the liability of our cognitive faculties. I mean, you look at, you know, I've heard it said, if you just look at the human eye, it proves that we are not from an evolutionary process. Your eye is the most we will never, and I truly believe this, world-renowned scientists have said, we will never be able to replicate the human eye. The human eye has such capabilities in and of itself. There is no man-made entity that can replicate it. If you work with cameras, I love photography. And that's one of the things I learned is that in photography, all a photograph is, is a measure of gray. Did you know that? All it is, is a measure of gray. Whether your ISO settings, your focal length, it doesn't matter how many megapixels or Google pixels you have, it's a measure of gray. Our eyes, the reason why, when you look at something, and Brother Gerald, you go, you know what? The picture doesn't do it justice. Because all the picture can do is capture the gray. But what our eye captures is the color. No man-made thing can do that. Do you also realize that there is no camera, it doesn't matter how many thousands of dollars you spend, that can focus with the length and the focal length if your, if your eye can? Do you know your eye can see far more than your brain can even comprehend? Isn't that amazing? Your eye can see if your brain could conceive it, even the deep parts of space is what scientists have said. Our eyes are amazing, amazing works of art. Amazing, creator, creator. Because I believe this, Brother Ken, God wants us to see light. He doesn't want us to see gray. He wants us to see light. Why is it that the great rainbow he gave as a covenant to his people is the spectrum of light. And John would say that God is light. You know, in the 1990s, they discovered that light has a personality. It's the strangest thing. That light will find its way through any measure of darkness. I can't get into the physics of that. I don't even understand what I just said. But what they say is you cannot hide light. Light will find its way and be revealed every single time. God is light. Amen. We sometimes want to put God in this, in this box and say, well, we can't look at, we can't be both a scientist and we can't love science and we can't love the Bible. Absolutely you can. I challenge you to watch these great science, sh these science shows that are out there. Some of them are really cool. Even when they talk about evolution, you go, ah, on that, ah, blah, 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 blah. Get to the good stuff. And that's when you get into where they start talking about Brother Gerald when they start getting into stuff like we can't figure out that one seventeenth of a second right before we got to creation. We can't, we can't find that one seventeenth. And you've got scientists scratching their head and you're sitting there going, because that's when God spoke. I can tell you what happened in that first seventeen thousandths of a second. God spoke. And when he said, let it be, it all became. And absolutely everything was hung on what had been absolutely nothing. But by the word of his power, everything that was nothing became something. And God hung everything on what had been nothing and said, now stay there. That is the glory of God. 
That is the majesty of God. Gravity is explained in the scripture. We go all the way back to Moses and the children of Israel. And it talks about that they can't eat pork. Why? Pork goes bad in heat, y'all. Plus, do not eat blood. We See, we didn't know about the germ theory until the middle of the 20th century. Most of them kind of knew a little bit about it at the end of the, end of the, end of the 19th century. But it really wasn't the 20th century that we really got the molecular understanding of it. But we came up with what was no, we discovered what was called germ theory. That there are microorganisms in blood that can kill you. So you don't drink blood. Everything had to be cooked. Everything had to be processed just right. One of the amazing things that you see in Scripture is even the very showbread. One thing that fascinates me is they said that the God, in, and, 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 and the rabbinical Jews still say that they don't understand how this, how this happened, but that the loaves that were brought, the, the showbread, to the tabernacle, they stayed warm for days and days. They never grew cold. Because God had woven his word into that process. And he was showing in that bread, the bread of the face, that the love of God never grows cold. The love of God never grows stale. It was important that the night of the Passover, that the wine that Jesus used was unfermented. Because there could be no leaven in the home during Passover. Because leaven spoke of sin. And for him to acknowledge that fruit of the vine as his blood, if it, had, if it was fermented, it would, it would indicate that there was sin in his blood. But his blood was sinless. Does science and the Bible support one another? Absolutely. We look at creation. You go through the book of Genesis and you see how God created the heavens and the earth and you see the process, the order by which he did it. And if you break those pieces down, if God had changed that order in any way, we would not have the creation that we have today. God, when Adam and Eve sinned, it said that he brought a curse and then all of a sudden, now this this beautiful garden. The curse entered in and all of a sudden now there were briars and there were thorns. And we see today that briars and thorns grow when there's no fertile ground. They can grow in the harshest of places. But you know one of the cool things? Some of the most beautiful flowers in the world come from a cactus. God in his creation shows us that no matter how prickly this thing may be and how dire, a, dire an environment it can grow in, there produces some of the most beautiful colors and beautiful flowers. When you and I understand that according to Job, God says he stores hail in the storehouses. How many of you have ever been in a hail store? See, the Bible describes meteorology before meteorology was ever called meteorology. God spoke of microbiology as far back as the book of Exodus. He describes gravity. The Bible describes every law of thermodynamics that we understand in physics are already described in Scripture. People who say that they do not complement one another, they've never read either one entirely. That's the reality of it. But science has helped theology, and theology has helped science. How are these houses happening? There are several areas where scientific discoveries have lent support to biblical assertions. And what is it? That the universe had a beginning. Oh, it had a beginning. Some call it the Big Bang. I don't care what you call it, because I know it was God who spoke it. Evidence that the universe is fine-tuned and delicately designed. 
Do you know our moon? If it was any closer or further away, our tides would be so unstable, we couldn't live on the coastal areas of the continents. Do you know if our sun, if we were only thousands of degrees closer to our sun or further away, it would be so cold we couldn't, there could not be life, or it would be so hot that there could not be life. There's evidence that suggests that there's no naturalistic explanation for the origin of life. Moreover, that life is characterized, characterized by information that always comes from a mind. Absolutely life has come from a mind. The greatest mind. The mind of God. Even science. When you get down to it, even the evolutions, the most hardcore evolutions that I've read, they still have to rely upon the fact somewhere that there was a beginning. We talked about this the other night. God, there was no beginning with God. God has always been. But creation had a beginning. And that creation began not with a what, but with a who. Archaeological confirmations. My goodness. There is hardly a day goes by that archaeology does not show the Bible being played out. For years, we thought Moses didn't exist. Oh, archaeologists found that out. And for years, we thought King David, or that David was never a king, and we found that to be true, according to archaeology. I, one of the, the neatest Bibles my mother-in-law ever bought me, each year she would buy me a really cool Bible, a really cool book for Christmas, and she bought me an archaeological Bible, archaeological study Bible. And it's so cool because I can go page by page and any archaeological evidence for any scripture is shown there. Pictures or an explanation or when the finding was made. And this Bible, it's that thick because we are seeing more and more findings. I get emails every week of archaeological findings of scriptural places. But you get to the Book of Mormon. Do you know there's not one geographic location that's described in the Book of Mormon, that there's any evidence that ever existed? We're going to be talking about Mormonism in a couple weeks, by the way. Psychological discoveries of the importance of a unified, spiritual, moral, free agent to explain human functioning and maturity. We've talked about this. God has given us free will, and God has given us this amazing mind. But what we see is that the farther we go from God, the more anxious and the more paranoid and the more anxiety and depression we have in our culture. I was telling our kids that Wednesday night. I said, we live, are living in a paranoid generation. We have separated ourselves from so many human contacts that we rely more upon data streams sometimes than just people hugging. We see people that we see it, we have seen, and Dale can confirm this as a pharmacist, we have seen an increase in antidepressants and anti-anxieties in United medications in the United States have made astronomical leaps in the last 30 years. We look at when prayer was taken out of school. Everything good has gone down and everything bad has gone up since prayer was taken out of school. From the years prayer was taken out of school, we have seen declines in test scores. We've seen decline in high school graduation. We've seen declines in college graduations. We have seen increases in abortion, increase in teenage pregnancy, increase in teen violence, and the list goes on and on. But what science has shown us and what the Bible teaches us is there is somebody that gives us moral absolutes. They can try to say that it's all relative and they can. our culture can talk about its truth all it wants to, but when it gets down to it, we realize at the end of the day that something has to be absolute. So church, when someone says, well, wait a minute, can sci our science and the Bible in opposition with each other say absolutely not? If they say, are the science and religion in opposition with one another, say absolutely yes, unless you're talking about Christianity. Christianity and science work together. So I always love to encourage our kids, study science. 
and read your Bible. And God's going to tell you all about it before we put a name on it. Amen? Everybody stand. The heavens declare your glory, O Lord, and the firmament your hand. Father God, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you, God, for your many blessings. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege the opportunity we have to gather in your name tonight. Lord, we ask that you take us home safely. Be with us this week as we minister for you. Lord, as you take us into the highways and the hedges, may the message of your gospel be upon our lips. May we put on Christ as we go into our places of work tomorrow, our places of service and of ministry. Lord God, be with us, watch over us, and protect us. Until we return again. Of course, in Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people say, Amen. 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 Have a hymn.